This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 12, coming up on Space Time. A new galaxy survey measuring the expanding universe. The Falcon Heavy blasts into history on a car trek beyond Mars. And discovery of one of the Milky Way's first stars. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are undertaking the most detailed survey ever attempted, measuring the current expansion rate of the universe. The study, to be known as the Taipan Galaxy Survey, will help scientists better determine the age and fate of the cosmos based on current and past expansion rates and those predicted for the future. To do this, Taipan will need to measure the current expansion rate of the universe with precision down to just 1%. In the process, Taipan hopes to resolve a nagging discrepancy between previous measurements of the current expansion rate using traditional cosmic distance ladders and measurements of the long-ago expansion rate using the radiation left over from the Big Bang 13.82 billion years ago. Traditional cosmic distance ladders involve using the parallax method to measure short distances across the cosmos. You see, by looking at an object from one side of Earth's orbit around the Sun and then looking at the same object from the opposite side of Earth's orbit around the Sun, a separation of 300 million kilometres, and by then comparing both views of the same object to distant background stars, scientists can calculate the distance to the object using plain old trigonometry. You can get the same effect by holding your thumb out in front of your nose at arm's length and then looking at it by alternatively closing one eye and then the other. To measure distances to nearby deep space objects in other galaxies, astronomers use a different process using stars known as Cepheid variables. These stars all brighten and fade at set rates based on their mass. So, by knowing the mass of one of these stars and how bright they appear, astronomers can use the inverse square law to determine their distance. The inverse square law tells us that a specified physical quantity or intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source of that physical quantity. Put simply, it's the same as looking at a row of streetlights down a dark road. The further away the streetlight is, the dimmer it will appear, even though in reality all the streetlights have the same luminosity. To measure the distance to very distant objects, astronomers use a different method, looking for exploding stars known as Type 1a or thermonuclear supernovae. Because these stars are all roughly the same mass when they explode, they all explode with roughly the same level of luminosity, thereby again allowing astronomers to use the inverse square law to determine their distance. Using this technique of cosmic ladders, or standard candles as they're sometimes called, astronomers have determined that the universe is currently expanding at a rate of about 70.4 kilometres per second per megaparsec, a number known as the Hubble constant. A megaparsec is a million parsecs, or about 3.3 million light years. It was the astronomer Edwin Hubble who first noticed that the universe was expanding. In 1929, based on a realisation by astronomer Harlow Shapley that galaxies all appear to be moving away from the Milky Way, Hubble found that the rate at which a galaxy was moving away from us was dependent on how far away that galaxy was, and the further away that galaxy was, the faster it appeared to be receding. And so the Hubble constant was born. However, a separate study using NASA's Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, which examined the cosmic microwave background radiation some 300,000 years after the Big Bang, has given a different figure for the Hubble constant of around 71 kilometres per second per megaparsec. And the problem is they can't both be right. The Taipan survey will try to shine a light on this discrepancy. The survey will use a new instrument being installed on the UK Schmidt Telescope at the Siding Spring Observatory in country New South Wales, west of Sydney. The project's lead scientist, Professor Matthew Collis from the Australian National University, describes Taipan as the most comprehensive spectroscopic survey of the southern skies ever undertaken. Taipan will map the entire southern hemisphere and even part of the northern hemisphere. It'll determine both the age and size of the universe with extraordinary precision. To do so, it'll measure the position of some 2 million galaxies and the velocities for some 100,000 of those galaxies. The unique properties of the UK Schmidt Telescope allow it to combine the functions of a wide field survey instrument and a powerful spectrograph, just the qualities needed to study more than half of the sky. The key to the project is a technology using mini-robots known as starbugs. 
These work to carefully place the spectrograph's optical fibre cables at very precise positions in order to gather the light from target stars and galaxies. The project will include growing the number of star bugs to be deployed from the current 150 up to around 300, doubling the speed of the survey. Using Taipan as a prototype, the Starbuck technology will eventually be applied to the new giant Magellan telescope, now under construction on a shaved-off mountaintop in Chile. Collis says Taipan will try to reduce the discrepancy between the different measurements for the Hubble constant from the current 2-3% to precision down to just 1%. He says if the discrepancy remains, then astronomers may well have uncovered the first chink in the standard model of cosmology in decades. So Taipan's a big new survey of the southern sky. We're about to start on the UK Schmidt telescope at Siding Spring Observatory. It's an Australian-based survey involving about 30 astronomers from around the country. We're planning to look at 2 million galaxies to measure their redshifts and about 100,000 galaxies will also measure their distances and their motions through space. And so by doing all of that, we plan to have the best map of the local universe that's ever been made. And this is part of a project to try and work out just how big and how old the universe is. That's one of our major goals. We're trying to measure the Hubble constant, which is the number that tells us how fast the universe is expanding. And by using that number, you can also work out how old the universe is and how big the universe is. We're aiming to, in fact, measure it with 1% precision for the first time in the local universe. It's been done at very high redshift in the very early universe by looking at the cosmic microwave background, which is the radiation left over from the Big Bang. And so the Planck satellite has measured the expansion rate right at the very beginning of the universe with much more precision than we've been able to do until now in the nearby universe. We're aiming to use Taipan to measure the Hubble expansion rate to 1% and that will give us the same sort of precision that we've had from the microwave background. And when we do that, we can actually link the beginning of the universe and the end and see whether our best model for the universe can link those two things and make sure that our model over the whole course of cosmic history hangs together in a consistent way. So this will tell us how and maybe even when the universe will end uh, and whether it'll be a, a big freeze or a, or a big rip. Well, we're pretty sure that the acceleration of the universe is uh, definitely happening already. And so the expansion of the universe will continue and accelerate unless there are further changes in the nature of the universe that we're not yet aware of. That means the universe will expand forever, probably not in a big rip. Everything looks as if it will just accelerate out and freeze out so that we will end up in that worst named of all uh, naming conventions in astronomy, the heat death of the universe, which is actually the freezing to death of the universe when everything just approaches absolute zero. Well, of course, that'll take longer than a big rip would, so that's probably good news. It is very good news. Big rip are bad. Big rips tear everything apart, limb from limb, atom from atom. Every skerrick of space gets torn to energetic shreds. So no, you don't want that to happen. How tough is it to carry out these sort of calculations and observations, knowing that there's still so much about both dark energy and dark matter, which we don't know? And they're both going to play a huge role in any conclusions you reach. So the, the nice thing about the measurement is that the measurement doesn't depend on how you interpret what's happening in the universe. You don't have to believe in dark matter, you don't have to believe in dark energy to actually make the measurement. That's the nice thing about science, is that you can make the measurement and then worry about what it means later. Here, all we're going to do is measure the average rate at which galaxies are moving apart from each other in the local universe. And that's a perfectly straightforward thing to do, at least in principle, of complications in practice. But there's nothing in principle difficult about that. How we interpret that is, as you say, much more difficult. But we are hoping that with the measurements we, can, we make, we will be able to at least say that, yes, indeed, the universe is moving as if it was filled with an enormous amount of dark matter and as if Einstein was right and dark energy, his cosmological constant, is providing an acceleration. Now, we can't say that those are definitely what is happening, but we can say that those models are very good models for the universe and we will, if everything goes the way we think it will, be able to say that with much more precision than it's been possible to say before. That's Professor Matthew Collis from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. (music) 
SpaceX has opened a new chapter in commercial deep space travel with a successful launch of the Falcon Heavy on its maiden flight. The new launch system combines three Falcon 9 core stages mounted side by side, making it the most powerful rocket currently available. Although the central core stage for this flight was new, the two side-mounted booster cores have each been flight-proven on previous Falcon 9 missions. The 70-metre-tall Falcon Heavy launch vehicle blasted off in the clear blue skies from Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center on the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. This was part of the same launch complex from which the mighty Saturn V Apollo moon rocket blasted off, carrying the first men to the lunar surface, and which later also launched the space shuttle. M1D fuel bleed complete. M1D engine chill is complete. AFTS is ready for launch. Stage 2 present for flight. Launch director on countdown 1. SpaceX Falcon Heavy, go for launch. Falcon Heavy is configured for flight. E-15, stand by for terminal count. Thousands of spectators crammed parks, beaches, roads and bridges surrounding the launch complex to witness the historic first test flight. The blast-off went like clockwork, with all 27 first-stage Merlin engines roaring into life and lifting the rocket clear of the launch tower on a golden column of flame. Ten, nine, eight, side booster ignition. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Supersonic. Side boosters are now throttling back up to full Vehicle power. Reached maximum dynamic pressure. We're past max Q, the period of maximum loads on the vehicle. Next up, we'll be waiting for the side boosters to begin to throttle down prior to booster engine cutoff and separation two and a half minutes into flight. GNC trajectory looks good on the Falcon Heavy. As the Falcon Heavy continued to climb skywards, mission managers were astounded at how well it met its performance parameters, including engine performance for all three Falcon 9 core stages, structural integrity at max Q, the point of maximum aerodynamic stress on the launch vehicle, and the side booster separation and return to Earth landing. In fact, looking like something out of a science fiction movie, the two side boosters return to Earth, touching down almost in unison, like a perfectly choreographed ballet on landing pads 1 and 2 at Cape Canaveral. The centre core stage, however, had a somewhat more eventful return to the planet's surface, apparently running out of fuel during the landing burn and crashing down onto its autonomous landing barge, Of Course I Still Love You, which was located downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Following the jettisoning of the core stages, the Falcon upper stage ignited its single Merlin vacuum engine for the first of three engine burns designed to take it out of low Earth orbit on a six-hour coasting phase through Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. The flight was designed to test the new launch system by placing a dummy payload into an elliptical Holloman transfer orbit between Earth and Mars. But instead of using a block of cement as the dummy payload, the mission instead used SpaceX box Elon Musk's own Tesla Roadster. Musk originally wanted to land the car on the surface of Mars, but international planetary protection rules prevented this due to the potential contamination risk posed. After all, if scientists do eventually find life on Mars, they want to make sure it's not life that came from Earth, nor do they want to kill off any Martian life that may exist there by potentially poisonous Earth life. Strapped inside the midnight cherry red-coloured sports car was a test dummy nicknamed Starman. Starman was wearing one of SpaceX's next-generation astronaut spacesuits, for fans of Top Gear, the whole thing would have looked very Stig-like. And to help set the mood for Starman's journey to Mars, the car's speakers were blaring with David Bowie's space oddity, set on repeat. Although when you think about it, being in the vacuum of space in an open-top convertible meant the speakers would have been useless. Displayed on the dashboard centre console were the words Don't Panic, in homage to Douglas Adams' book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, apparently a Musk favourite. As it began its journey to Mars, SpaceX released some stunning images of the sports car and its passenger, with the blue marble of the Earth in the background against the velvet blackness of space. However, it turns out things didn't go quite according to plan. You see, the last of those three engine burns carried out by the Falcon 9 upper stage was designed to place the spacecraft into its trans-Mars interplanetary orbit. 
However, according to Musk, that third burn exceeded expectations, instead placing Starman and the Roadster on a long elliptical orbital loop around the Sun, which will eventually intercept the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. At perihelion, their closest orbital position to the Sun, Starman and the Roadster will fly just inside Earth's orbit. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, let's take a break from our program now so I can tell you about our new sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Like you, I didn't stop learning when I finished school. There's still so much out there I want to know. And that's why I'm so excited about The Great Courses Plus, And I want you to check it out for yourself. The Great Courses Plus means unlimited access to learning from some of the world's top professors and experts in virtually any category. Be it history, science, business, art, music, even how to cook or take better photos. There are thousands of video and audio lectures to choose from. You can even learn while working out at the gym, walking down the road, or commuting to work. There's no homework and no pressure of exams, just lifelong learning at its best. Now, to get you started, I recommend starting with a course that I've enjoyed, The Inexplicable Universe with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. He delves into the very heart of summer science's greatest mysteries, including black holes, the possibility of extraterrestrial life, and multiple universes. You can even learn about quarks. Now, the great thing about these courses is they're not like uni lectures. They're just in plain English, and they're not dumbed down. Neil makes it easy to follow along, with complex scientific principles explained. And if there is something you want to go over again, just hit the rewind button. And I've got an exclusive offer to get you started. As a listener of Space Time, you'll get a full month of unlimited access to enjoy all of their lectures for free. But in order to get this, you need to go to our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And if you reach the end of the month and don't want to continue, no problem. That offer again is a month absolutely free to try out any or all of the courses. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And I'll put the URL in the show notes and on our website. This offer is good for the United States, Canada, the UK and Australia. So you can help our show out and do yourself a brilliant favour at the same time. And it's all for free. TheGreatCoursesPlus.com slash space. And now it's back to the show. Astronomers have found one of the most primitive stars in the Milky Way galaxy. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, indicates the star, designated J0815 plus 4729, formed some 13.5 billion years ago. The star, which has about 70% the mass of the Sun, was detected some 32,600 light years away in the galactic halo in the direction of the constellation Lynx. The star was identified through its spectroscopic signature, the chemical composition of its atmosphere. Other than hydrogen, all the elements on the periodic table are produced by stars, either through fusion in their cores or outer layers, or when they die in spectacular supernova explosions, or when their stellar corpses collide and merge. The very first stars to shine in the universe, known as Population 3 stars, formed out of the pure hydrogen and helium produced in the Big Bang, with only trace amounts of lithium and beryllium. These properties meant these first stars were extremely large, very luminous blue stars, dozens if not hundreds of times the mass of the Sun. The thing is, high-mass stars don't live long. They tend to burn through their fuel supplies very quickly, and so they live short but bright lives, sort of like the James Deans of the astronomical world. Because they burn through their fuel supplies so quickly, they tend to die out quickly as well, in powerful supernova explosions. And when they die and go supernova, they seed the cosmos with all the heavier elements on the periodic table. In fact, astronomers refer to all these elements other than hydrogen and helium as metals. And it's these metals which then go into the next generation of stars, known as Population 2 stars. J0815 plus 4729 is thought to be one of these Population 2 stars. Still later generations of stars, like our Sun for example, which have even higher levels of metallicity, are referred to as Population 1 stars. The discovery of J0815 plus 4729, which is one of the lowest metallicities ever detected, will allow astronomers to study the formation of some of the first chemical elements in the galaxy. The star is still on the main sequence, a stage at which most stars spend the major part of their lives fusing hydrogen in their core into helium. Interestingly, despite its low mass, the star's surface temperature is some 400 degrees hotter than the Sun, possibly due to its lower metallicity. 
The spectroscopic data also shows that this star has about a million times less calcium and iron than the Sun, a feature only found in early generation stars, as later stars, such as the Sun, are formed out of molecular gas and dust clouds, which contain higher levels of these elements. Astronomers also found that this star has a comparatively large abundance of carbon, nearly 15% more than the Sun. This finding supports earlier studies suggesting that low-mass metallicity stars likely developed an overabundance of carbon accreted from the earlier high-mass population 3 stars. The star was first identified by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey database within the BOSS Baryon Oscillation Spectric Survey project. It was then observed more closely using the ISIS spectrograph on the William Herschel Telescope in the Canary Islands with additional data obtained using the OSIRIS spectrograph on the Grand Telescope at the Canary Islands Observatory near La Palma. Interestingly, some of the older stars ever identified were not found in the galactic halo, but in the galaxy's central bulge. These stars date back almost 13.6 billion years. That's 100 million years earlier than J0815 plus 4729, and just 200 million years after the birth of the universe. Because these stars have been around for so long, they can retain information in their atmospheres about what the universe was like when they formed. The oldest of these stars is a red giant designated SMSS J181609.62 minus 3332187, which is located about 25,000 light years away. It's thought to have started out as a fairly ordinary orange dwarf star of about 0.8 solar masses, making it slightly smaller and cooler than the Sun. But when they checked its spectrographic signature, they found it had an iron abundance some 10,000 times lower than that of the Sun, and no detectable carbon signature at all. One of the nearest of these ancient population 2 stars to the Earth is HD 140283, the Methuselah star, a metal poor subgiant just 190 light years away in the constellation Libra. Spectroscopic analysis indicates that this star has an iron content about a factor of 250 lower than that of the Sun. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Well, in case you missed it, planet Earth's just survived two near misses by near-Earth asteroids. The two space rocks were discovered just a week before their close encounter with our planet by astronomers at the NASA-funded Catalina Sky Survey near Tucson, Arizona. Both these asteroids flew by closer than the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Both were discovered on February 4th. The first was designated asteroid 2018 CC. Its closest approach to Earth came just two days after its discovery, passing at a distance of 184,000 kilometres. The asteroid was estimated to be between 15 and 30 metres in size. Of potentially greater interest is asteroid 2018 CB, which zoomed past the Earth on Friday, February the 9th, at a distance of just 64,000 kilometres. That's less than a fifth the distance from the Earth to the Moon. It was estimated to be anywhere up to 40 metres wide. Paul Chodas from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says although asteroid 2018 CB sounds quite small, it might well be larger than the asteroid which entered the atmosphere and airburst over the city of Chelyablinsk in Russia almost exactly five years ago in 2013. The shockwaves triggered by that asteroid's explosion shattered windows and damaged buildings across the city, in the process injuring over 1,200 people. Chodas says asteroids of this size don't often approach this close to the Earth, maybe only once or twice a year. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that living or working near noisy roads may be harming your health. The findings reported in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology show that busy roads may be adding to heart problems by stressing people out. Researchers say the evidence suggests excessive noise from roads or passing aircraft sets off a stress response in our body by, for example, raising heart rates, tightening blood vessels and releasing more stress hormones, which could ultimately contribute to heart disease. Well, if you've taken up vaping e-cigarettes as a way to avoid the carcinogenic byproducts of tobacco, think again. A new study warns that e-cigarettes cause DNA damage to the heart, lungs and bladder. 
e-cigarettes deliver nicotine as an aerosol and are marketed as a safer alternative to smoking tobacco. The findings, reported in the journal PNAS, show exposure to e-cigarette smoke causes a reduction in DNA repair activity and lower levels of several DNA proteins in the lungs. Similar effects were observed in human lung and bladder cells exposed to nicotine and nicotine-derived nitrosamine ketone, or NNK, a carcinogenic nicotine derivative. Human cells exposed to nicotine and NNK also had higher rates of mutation and tumorigenic transformation. The findings show that while e-cigarette smoke does have fewer carcinogens than tobacco smoke, e-cigarette smokers may still have a higher risk of developing lung and bladder cancers and heart diseases. Meanwhile, a separate study has found that e-cigarette flavours are toxic to white blood cells. The findings, reported in the journal Frontiers in Physiology, warns that cinnamon, vanilla and buttery e-cigarette flavours are among the most toxic, and mixing flavours is even more damaging than vaping just one. Scientists found the e-cigarette flavouring chemicals and liquids can cause significant inflammation to monocytes, a type of white blood cell, and many of the flavouring compounds are also toxic. Vaping exposes lungs to flavouring chemicals when the e-liquids are heated and inhaled. Since these flavouring chemicals are considered safe to eat, e-cigarettes are often considered and advertised as a healthier alternative to traditional cigarettes. However, the health effects of inhaling these chemicals are not well understood. Previous studies show that flavours used in e-cigarettes cause inflammatory and oxidative stress responses in lung cells. Users of e-cigarettes also showed increased levels of oxidative stress markers in blood compared to non-smokers. A new study of the DNA of endangered blue whales, world's largest living animal, has shown that Australia is home to a population of blue whales that likely travels widely and has become adapted to a wide range of environmental conditions. The findings reported in the journal Open Science show that blue whales are in Australian waters at the moment, taking advantage of the abundance of krill that occurs during the Australian summer. However, researchers say questions remain about whether the blue whales in Australian waters are one interbreeding population or whether they're multiple populations that may have different adaptions to different environmental conditions. A new study suggests that having a partner or close friend who thinks the way you do isn't just a coincidence. Researchers reached their conclusions by mapping out the social network of university student test subjects measuring who was friends with whom. They then conducted MRI scans of 42 students while they watched videos. They found that friends' brains showed similarities in their responses to the videos. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Communications, suggest that people might become friends with those who see the world in a similar way, or perhaps simply being friends leads to people thinking more alike. It looks like all systems are go for the introduction next year of the 5G telecommunications network. It's being described as a far bigger revolution than what 4G was over 3G, with greatly improved coverage and data rates of hundreds of megabits, even gigabits per second, depending on where you are. With all the details, we're joined by Alex Ahar of Reut from IT Wire. In a couple of big 5G announcements this week, Optus announced that it was going to be installing fixed 5G networks from early 2019 in major metropolitan centres. And they had a trial last year that uh, was delivering 15 gigabits to a single user. And they're saying that that's 15 times what 4.5G is capable of today. But uh, 5G is designed to do a lot more than, than just that. I have you know, heard of different predictions that were you know, a thousand times this and a thousand times that, but there are no currently no standards for 5G deployments in terms of the ones for uh, mobile uses. There have been some standards set by the 3GPP, and there'll be another big meeting in uh, the Gold Coast hosted by Telstra this year in September. But the 5G standard talks about data rates of tens of megabits per second for tens of thousands of users, 100 megabits per second for metropolitan areas, a gigabit per second simultaneously to many workers on the same floor, and also very low latency. Everything will be much, much faster. One of the examples that Telstra gives, which had its own big announcement of opening up a 5G centre of excellence on the Gold Coast just in time for the Commonwealth Games. But there's so many people there that they're going to be uh, testing it. They've talked about speed tests of about 3 gigabits down and 300 megabits up over millimetre wave spectrum. They'll also be using 3.6 gigahertz spectrum, at least Telstra will. And they're specifically licensing some of that, some of that spectrum for this trial period where there'll be lots of sports people. How do you people. trial a 5G system when no one actually has 5G phones? Well, because you're, you're using mobile hotspots and fixed 5G equipment. And also they'd be using test 5G 
5G mobile devices from Qualcomm and Ericsson, their partners in this. Qualcomm has said there's no 5G phones until 2019. And we, we have in the States, uh, at and is already talking about 5G evolution. It's kind of jumping the gun a little bit to describe some of its 4.5G technologies as on the road to 5G. They did that same trick when 4G came around. Their 3.75G network wasn't true 4G, but they were calling it 4G or LTE, whatever it was at the time. The 5G deployments are happening, tests are happening this year, more deployments are happening next year, and then the commercial deployments in terms of mobile phones, tablets, IoT devices, cars, anywhere that's truly mobile, the way we use 4G phones today, that'll be happening more or less from truly properly from 2020 onwards through to 2025, and then I guess we start talking about 6G. Alex Sahar of Reut from ITY reporting. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Today's episode of Space Time has been brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. For one month's free access to all their courses, use our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space.